The broadcast will begin soon. Please stay tuned. Hello, and welcome to the San Diego SHRM webinar, Solving the Leave Management Puzzle, Challenges and Best Practices. My name is Tamara Small, and I am the Membership Coordinator for San Diego SHRM. Please note that the recertification credit will be emailed out to the active participants after the webinar. Before we begin, there are a few housekeeping items to note. This webinar is being recorded. To avoid background noise, we are meeting everyone's lines But you can ask questions in the question box on the panel. If you don't see the panel, please expand it by hitting the orange arrow. As you know, technical issues may arise, so for whatever reason audio is lost, please let us know in the question box immediately. This is rare, but if it happens, it is usually just for a few seconds. Before I introduce today's speaker, I would like to invite you to attend San Diego Sherm's upcoming event. Next Wednesday, March 20th, we have our first membership mixer of the year. Please join us for great networking, delicious food, and a great opportunity to meet with fellow HR professionals in San Diego County. Registration prices will increase at the close of business this Friday, so please register today. We will also be offering a discount for the mixer, so keep an eye on your email for the promo code. There will also be a new member orientation prior to the membership mixer at 445. It is a great chance to learn how to maximize your San Diego SHRM membership and how to get involved. And finally, we have a breakfast program on April 18th, the anatomy of Namatsu and the tools for prevention. Registration is now open on our website. Before I introduce the featured speaker, I would like to welcome the hosts of the webinar, Maria Keith and Stephen Kelly, to give you a brief overview of their company, Westpac Wealth Partners. Thank you, Tamara, and uh, the team at SHRM for allowing us to host uh, such an important topic for human resources professionals. As Tamara mentioned, my name is Maria Keith, and I'm joined here by my colleague, Stephen Kelly. So we wanted to take a couple minutes and make a quick introduction to Westpac Wealth Partners and position ourselves as a resource to you and your employers. Uh, we are a privately held boutique wealth management firm with locations in seven states, and we are rapidly growing and adding new offices almost annually. So we're very ex excited about our expansion. And the reason why we're so successful and what, uh, what is the key differentiator that we have is we recruit the top resources in the industry. And that allows us to help our clients at different business stages from startup, to grow through maturity and eventually the exit of the business. So we know that each employer is different and have different needs. So our focus is on tailoring employee benefits to each employer that we work with. Whether you're a startup company and just started the business or you're a mature company with 10,000 employees or more, we can help you review your existing benefit package, expand your existing benefit um, offerings and lineup, benchmark your 401k plan or execute on a business succession planning and as we partner with our clients we always tend to inform them on the new trends and what's going on in the industry 
So currently there are two new trends, um, very uh, exciting trends that we wanted to share with you today uh, that are happening in the employee benefits industry. So one trend is uh, helping employees to save for college tuition. So I wanted to specifically mention that. And we offer a solution there by offering a college tuition benefit that helps employers to save for tuition at private colleges through a point system. And another trend that we're very excited to tell you about, and I wanted to specifically single that out, is to help employees with financial wellness. So I wanted to introduce you to our turnkey financial wellness program called WellSteps. And as a human resources professionals, uh, you may have seen the studies, may have read the studies uh, that are done on the importance of financial wellness and how it helps to increase employee productivity. Uh, in today's competitive market, uh, the top talent that comes to you is expecting more resources and more support from you as an employer. Um, so financial wellness and education has been one of the trends in the industry where the employees are expecting some support from their employers. We've recognized the need and we have a solution for you. Uh, the program called Wealth Steps and it helps you address the employee financial wellness. We know you're very busy as HR professionals, so we definitely don't want to uh, create too much work for you, which is why we uh, created this program as a completely turnkey program. It's easy to implement and it's easy to monitor and it's very simple for your employees to use. So we hope you get as excited as we are about the employee financial wellness and let us know if you would like to schedule a 15 minute demo or a conversation or have any questions on it. So our contact information is in front of you at Maria Keith or Stephen Kelly. Reach out, uh, email us or call us at uh, any time. You're welcome to call us for quotes, for illustrations, whether you have already existing benefits, would like to review, um, would like to add to your benefits, would like to benchmark to other similar benefits in the industry, or would like to schedule a well steps demo. Um, so we'll have our contact information towards the end of this presentation, but I don't want to take up too much time and uh, want to turn it back to Tamara so she can introduce our exciting speaker for today. Thank you, Maria. It is now my pleasure to introduce our featured presenter, Jennifer Lyons, Marketing Manager for Guardian Life. Jennifer is responsible for supporting thought leadership activities for the group and worksite market business. Jennifer has been with Guardian for 10 years. She has 20 years of experience in the in insurance industry, specializing in absence, disability, and life products. She has held positions in underwriting and product and business development with several of the largest group insurance carriers. Please welcome Jennifer. Thank you, and welcome to the audience. I know it's morning on the, East Coast, on the West Coast and it's afternoon here, so I'll say good morning. Um, today we're gonna to talk about solving the leave management puzzles both the challenges and the solutions. And specifically, we're gonna talk about leave management laws, cover some of the basics, make sure that we have a firm understanding, talk about how some of the states are starting to increase their regulation. We're gonna talk about the market trends. Um, we do a report and a survey every two years, and we're gonna talk about what other employers experience, how they're dealing with these new laws, and where do they find some of their challenges? What do they tell us is a problem for them? And then how are they solutioning for that? We'll talk about some best practices and we'll offer you some solutions. I hope that today is interactive as it can be. So please use that chat and um, question box. We'll um, try to take questions throughout, but also it's a great way for me to understand um, if I need to slow down or go back over something. So a little bit about the research that we will discuss. Guardian releases its own research on absence management every two years. We started our study in 2012 and have recently put together the newest release, which will be coming in um, 2019, in the next month or so. The study is representative nationally of different employers, both from a size segment perspective, industry, and location. So it goes beyond just Guardian's client. It really gets a pulse for what employers are facing. And that's where you'll see the majority of our facts and statistics come from. It's what we've learned from folks like yourselves. 
um, in 2012, when we launched the first study, we talked about the five best practices. So we went out and we identified groups that had um, achieved proficiency in their absence management plan were a little bit ahead. And we said, what are they doing? And what can we learn from that to help other employers know what they should be incorporating regardless of where they are in that continuum, whether they're outsourcing or they're in-house, and also whatever model that they might be using. And we formed those five best practices. In 2000. 14, we really created a roadmap for those groups that were just getting started. We've seen um, a large growth in employers who may be in that, what I'll call mid-sized, under a thousand lives, but still subject to the law because we know FML at the federal level goes down to 50 lives, but surely we know that some of the states go down even be beyond that. So how do they get started? What was their path look like? And how do they incorporate those five best practices? And 2014 study addresses that. In 2016, we saw a growth in outsourcing. Again, awareness picked up, employers looked for solutions, and the marketplace answered for them. Um, we provided an outline of how to have the discussion and what you should consider. Outsourcing isn't perfect for everyone, although it definitely is a strong solution and there's some good reasons to do it, but it is a process and each company needs to weigh that carefully and make sure that they're ready for that step. And in our 2018 study, we really started to understand this integrated holistic approach. Employers started to tell us that they're not looking at it anymore as FML kind of over here on the side and ADA and maybe their company leave. But it's really about bringing it all together, focusing on the employee, making sure that they have the right information at the right time, and really treating the leave as a holistic end-to-end um, -end process and event. And that's really paying off, and we'll talk more about that in a few minutes. So I'm sure, as you all know, the State leave laws are making news. So if we just look at 2019 and the start, we can see that there's been numerous new state leave laws um, from Vermont and New Hampshire to the most recent change in New Jersey. And maybe the audience can let me know um, how many of you are multi-location or multi-state employers. If, if we're able to do that in the question box, that would be great. But certainly we continue to watch What's happening in Washington, Massachusetts, New York continues to um, refine their program as they kicked off in 2018. And then there's the expansion that we're seeing, such as in New Jersey. So just a sampling of what employers are dealing with. Yeah, and I think quite a few of you are in, in different states, so I'm sure you know, you're probably keeping an eye on this. And we'll talk a little bit more about how that's affecting employers, both in you know, presenting a challenge, but also where they're gaining a little bit of ground. So as part of the um, survey and as part of the report, we ask employers a series of questions and that formulates um, different scores. And we'll explain a little bit more through that. But as you can see, there's a higher priority on leave management. And these are employers that self-report that they are making some type of effort and usually some type of major effort in order to reduce absenteeism. Um, from 2014 to 2018, the growth has been double digits. And if we look specifically at that 50 to 250 lives, that growth is almost, um, it's at a 90% increase. So we see 90% increases between those that maybe said to us, you know, I'm not really worried about that to, you want to know what, I'm making a major effort over these last four years. And there's a few reasons why that's happening, and that's the increased compliance. The state leave laws are causing employers to understand a little bit more about what they're, hap what they're responsible for. Certainly, we saw that uptick happen, as you can see, in 2016, right around when healthcare reform came out. And this idea of compliance started to really creep into employers' um, purview. They started to understand a little bit more about what they were responsible for and certainly how that affects their organization. And we'll talk that it's gone beyond just compliance, and it really becomes about 
the public face of your company potentially to some outside vendors. So we created the score that kind of allows us to see how employers are progressing. And as you can see, a 35% increase, which is great. We've gone from 3.7 all the way up to 5.0, and we can get really excited about that. Employers are taking steps, they're, they're better against the, those five best practices I mentioned, and we can be excited. We need to temper that excitement with understanding that this is a 10 point scale. So in fact, there's still a lot that employers can do to continue to refine and make advancements. And that's important as we go through, you know, absence management on a toll is not a one and done. You don't just write your policy and forget about it. It's an ongoing um, process. It's something that should be reviewed and um, updated periodically and a check-in if for no other reason than training. And you can see growth is across the board. Um, our small market groups, those 50 to 249, that smaller end of the mid-size, have been growing about 30%. They're catching up to where some of their larger counterparts are. And this is really the combination of the availability of solutions and the greater understanding of the impact on absence management to their business. Um, certainly, we see that growth across our you know, 250 to just under 1,000 and our 1,000 plus with the idea that our 1,000 plus are really gaining um, traction to move beyond that midpoint and into some more advanced setup. So they're a little bit ahead, but our, our smaller end of the mid-sized market is catching up quickly. And we find that there are some key industries that really push those boundaries. We look at financial services, we look at healthcare companies, um, retail, education, and tech, and we see that their scores are all at or above that median score. And some of the drivers there is a little bit of, of two pieces. One, they are on the cutting edge. If we think about high tech companies, they're leading with some of the paternity leaves, um, some of the idea of unlimited PTO, just kind of being a little bit more paternalistic in their policies. But then if we look at some place like healthcare and retail, that wouldn't necessarily strike us as being um, right on that cutting edge as, as part of that. But I think because they've had to make sure that their policies are buttoned up, they really understand how their return to work and their call-out procedures affect their employees. They've made remarkable strides and kind of lead the way in understanding how to communicate as well as document their policies and procedures, and that really helps with their scores. And I think there's a lot to learn from those segments around the importance of having documented your fully returned to work, which brings us to our five best practices. So in the beginning, I said when we first started, we were looking at what um, is important to predict a positive outcome. And that positive outcome is for the employer understanding that it's important for your employees to be at work in order to do your day-to-day -day, um, operations, but also for your employees. How do they feel? Do they feel supported? Do they feel engaged? Um, is that a positive interaction? If we think about when an employee comes into the absence management segment, it's usually during a stressful period, even if it's for a pregnancy, which is a joyous event. The employee needs that support. And so having a positive outcome that they feel that they have it, um, that they've been supported is key and important. So with that being said, let's talk a little bit more about those five best practices. And the five best practices really focus around three particular items, people, process, and technology. And um, I had a colleague that had a great saying, and, and I'll share it with you. What's the three rules of real estate? Location, 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 right? And I'm sure being in San Diego, you probably hear that a lot. Um, when we talk about the three rules of absence management, it's document, document, document. And that is really key um, to our program and to your success. So having that fully returned to work program, having it documented in a way that employees are able to access it and understand is key. 
making sure that your central your process for intake is centralized and that really supports the um, last two pieces which is your reporting and your health management integration and that same resource for STD and FML. Is there end-to-end -end site for you as an employer? Are you able to understand and engage? Um, but also, what does that mean for your employee? Are you being able to offer them all of the other support programs that you may have available um, that they may not realize at the time where they need it most? So fully return to work program that's documented and clearly communicated. A centralized intake, we know we have better compliance, the less phone calls an employee has to make. The same resource for STD and FML, creating that line of sight and certainly making sure that um, employees understand what's available. Are you able to understand your reporting? Do you know who's out and what the expectations in? And then lastly, are you able to integrate with your health management um, programs such as EAP, maybe a disease management, where the employee is getting the necessary support during that leave. Um, we also want to talk about how employers are progressing on those five best practices. So certainly as we look against, and I'm sorry guys, as we look against 2014 to our most current um, we see that the biggest gain is utilizing the same resource for STD and FML. And, and just to note, that does not have to be an outsourced resource. That could be the same team within your company. But making sure that it's all consolidated, that your employees um, are understand what's happening, and that they are clear in their process. And that's important. They're then focusing on centralizing that intake as part of that um, same resource, making sure and limiting the steps and handoffs that they have. Next, they're going to that integration. And I think what's important here is that as they kind of go through this process, they're building. One piece builds upon the other, and you can see employers are taking those steps. So just a fun piece around basics that hopefully um, you guys will enjoy, and it's kind of the pop quiz on the FML refresher. I'll go through these quickly. Um, private employers must employ how many employees and how many radi mile radius of the work site. So um, I'll quickly fill these in. So we know that there are 50 employees or more, and of course, it's a 75-mile radius. True or false, do public employers and schools um, have a minimum required employees? And the answer to that is true. They do not have a minimum number of employees. Every public employer and every school system is subject to FML. Um, employees must be employed for how many months? And does that have to be consecutive? It's 12 months. And it doesn't have to be consecutive. It's actually within a seven-year period. So I don't know if the group on the line, if we think about some of the industries, if you have seasonal employees that maybe you let go and then they come back, they certainly can accumulate those 12 months over that seven-year period. Um, but they actually have to work that 1,250 hours within the last 12 months. So... Um, What's key in this fact is, is that that is usually less than what most benefit eligible um, requirements are. So we're really talking about an expanded population. It works out to about 20 hours per week, so it does include your part-timers. Um, employees are eligible for 12 or 26 weeks of unpaid leave, and that's within a 20 in a 12 month period. And of course that 26 weeks is really referring to the military instingency leave. Um, employers on FML don't need to maintain health benefits and that's false. You have to continue to provide the contributions in order to keep them as if they were not out on work. And um, employees can request leave for various reasons and that includes a spouse, a child, 
or a parent. And where I think we're seeing a lot of um, interaction here is where some of the states are broadening that definition around a family member. So what is eligible for a leave? And the most common reason is an employee's own serious health conditions. The rule of thumb is about 60 to 70% of all FML leaves have a coexisting um, STD request. So that's why bringing those two processes together are so important is because a lot of that's going to run concurrent. And when we factor into things such as the intermittent leave, um, being able to have that line of sight that we talked about earlier in order to prevent maybe an STD request becomes so important. Job restoration. So making sure that you return your employee to the same shift, that they're in the same location and the same eligibility for bonuses and overtime is key to complying with FML. And it's probably the number one place where employers end up in trouble. Um, maybe they didn't realize that it had to be the same place, something's a little bit different. Um, and a lot of times we'll see that happen if we have an employee who is on a PIP or a performance improvement plan. Um, you almost need to go and get your whiteout or backspace key and take the name out of the system so that it almost looks as if um, it's a blind. That employee who is having a performance issue is treated no differently than your maybe employee that is excelling at their job. When that um, request comes in and as you follow that process, you're treating them identical as if you didn't know the name. So as we look at where employers tell us our top challenges, their top challenges are, it's definitely compliance. And as you can see, um, it is not getting any easier for you out there. In fact, you're telling us that it's more difficult and it really follows along a few different um, areas. Coordinating all of these different absence types, making sure that your employees are fit to come back, but also implying things such as ADA and that intermittent tracking, and just simply keeping up with the federal and the state leave laws. All of that presents a unique challenge to employers. Um, I think one of the things interesting here is making decisions on FML requests. There's been very little um, changes to the law. And in fact, it's been pretty st steady and kind of um, consistent. We've had some rulings that have clarified, but no real changes. And yet it's 48% um, increase or change in those reporting that it's actually getting harder to make decisions. And that's really around understanding what is a serious health condition. How do I go ahead and make that determination where I may not have all of the information because of the nature? And I think that's one of the reasons why employers do look towards outsourcing. It kind of takes them out of the mix and they're able to do that um, through a third party, which allows them to buffer a little bit more, but certainly not getting um, easier. And then, of course, there's things such as exceptions for key employees and, of course, military leave. So we asked in our 2018 survey, we asked our employers about how confident they were in if they had a DOL audit. So we all know that the DOL can call you up at any time and they can say, hey, we're coming in five days and we're going to audit your FML practices. Um, one of the reasons for this is they may have gotten a complaint or the DOL is actually taking a more proactive choice and a proactive view of how to um, monitor and um, police compliance to FML. So we asked employers, how confident are you? And nine and 10 said they would have no problems um, passing a DOL audit. When we asked them some common questions around what would be considered um, the basics, what we found is that they actually didn't do as well as they thought. Um, four in 10 employees sur employers surveyed outwardly told us that they count FML against their absentee policy for the purposes of disciplinary reasons. And we know that should never be happening. That's the exact reason why FML was um, enacted and the government kind of said, you, you can't do that. These are excused, if you will. They have to almost pretend like they don't exist. Um, six in 10 
say that they approve an FML request for a non-qualified leave. So just a little bit of distinction. Um, we're not saying that the leave isn't legitimate, but it doesn't qualify under the FML guidelines. So maybe they're including it for in-laws. So they decided to extend the time or they're including it for an employee that hasn't quite met the time period requirement. Um, the issue with that, and we'll talk about this a little bit more when we get to rubber stamping, is, is that it could cause an employer to actually um, disapprove or deny a legitimate leave. And the federal government says that you can't track non-qualified um, leave time from the bank. Um, going back to what I said, where there is a STD claim, there should always be an FML request, even if it's only to send out the paperwork saying that they're not qualified. And it, only um, two and three are saying that that's happening. And in fact, that should be closer to 100%. Um, six and 10 employers admit that they're not tracking their FML leaves. Um, they kind of just leave it up to the individual. They're not really getting that. A lot of times we'll hear employers tell us, oh, we tell them to take it off or not to worry about it. We don't count it. And we'll talk a little bit more about where that can get you into trouble. And then the other piece is five and 10 just say, you want to know what? I'm not dealing with compliance at all. So I'll just approve everything. I'll rubber stamp it all. And what we found is, is that when we take into account all of these different um, answers and where they line up on a grading scale, in fact, the average is actually a C minus. So there's a big disconnect between where employers feel that they have, um, are doing well and are confident. And then when we ask them and dig into a little bit to their processes, we find out that they're not as doing as well as they would think. So a little bit about intermittent leave, that's one of the areas that, that popped on the challenges. It's one of those places where employees, um, employers kind of say, you wanna know what, that, that's really hard for me to get together and, and understand and keep track of. Um, each leave, so each single qualifying reason can actually generate a separate leave. Um, so you you are well within your rights to require that an employee um, goes ahead and submits a leave if they have multiple doctors. They are allowed for all reasons except for parental and bonding. So when you set up your policies and your procedures, you need to call out if you're going to allow um, intermittent leave to be used for those types of um, leaves. It includes providing care and psychological com um, comfort. So having a an employee sit with their family member while they're in the hospital um, to provide that kind of comfort is one of the reasons why you can take intermittent leave. Here's the one that employers don't necessarily um, always pick up on. You can actually request that appointments be scheduled when it's least disruptive to your business operations. Um, most employers don't like to push back because they're afraid that it will be viewed as being um, as interfering, but certainly it's within your right under the law to kind of say, hey, you know, the 15th of every month, I have a big um, shipment that comes in. It's kind of our monthly inventory and it needs to get stacked. Can we, you know, see, is it really medically necessary that you go out on that 15th? And it would be better if we scheduled that either at the beginning or the end. It, it has to um, not interrupt their medical needs, but certainly you can go ahead and push back if it's um, not, if it's too disruptive to you. We talked a little bit about rubber stamping and rubber stamping is where um, employers just approve everything. They come back in and they say to us, you want to know what? I certainly um, don't have any issues because I just approve it all. And they kind of view that as reducing their liability. Maybe they're not sure what they can question and pull back on, push back on. And then of course they want to avoid conflict. They just don't want to deal with having to tell that employee no. And um, that really um, sets an employer up to um, have issues. And those issues include encouraging misuse, and employees talk to each other. They know if you're just going to approve it, um, they're going to go ahead and ask for it. 
Um, but the real issue comes in, in that idea of denying a legitimate leave. So certainly, um, we talked about this earlier, you go ahead and you dock that time, which the law says you you can't. And then that employee comes back in and says, you know, I don't need to take care of my father-in-law, but I need to go out for my own condition. And you deny that leave because they've used up their time for something that they shouldn't have been approved. And that's where the government would come back in and say, you're in violation of the FML law. The other issue is, is that when you finally hit to the point that you deny a leave, that it's become excessive, um, maybe you have that one employee that's misusing, and you go ahead and you say no, it can appear like discrimination. You're only saying no because of who I am. Go back to that idea of your two employees, your star employee and your um, struggling employee. When that struggling employee hits that end and you tell them no, now it appears like you're discriminating against them because of who they are and kind of what's happening. Um, it's also in this particular part that it's so important to have your your policies clearly documented. When you have your policies documented that says this is what's going to happen, regardless of who it is, regardless of the situation, before we even get there, having that outline so that everybody understands the process and the policy prevents a discrimination because you're not making that judgment based upon an individual situation. So it goes back to that idea of document, document, document. So at the end of the day, although it's all important, right, and we want to talk about, um, you know, some of the different factors that go into why we want to, on, you know, uphold FML, at the end of the day, it's also a, a real intangible cost about mismanagement. Um, the average course, even if you do everything right to just defend yourself against a lawsuit, is $78,000. And I've seen figures that it's probably closer to $90,000. Um, that's before we get into damages and awards. Um, certainly, they can go up to 40, 450000 and that's kind of the average taking the highs and the lows. We're not talking about those runaways that sometimes we see. Um, but we've also seen an increase in litigation, um, about 26%. And really what happens is this, the employee calls into the DOL and they say, I think my, right ha I think my rights have been violated. And the DOL kicks off two issues. They hook that employee up with a lawyer so that they have an attorney and they go ahead and they open an investigation and every complaint is investigated. Um, the DOL is changing their approach. Instead of being reactive, they're acti actually looking at proactive steps. And certainly they're looking at things that are within the policies and procedures that are systematically out of compliance. And what sometimes employers forget is, is that they're fined for each incident or occurrence of that violation. So if you forgot to send out your paperwork and you did that 10 times, that fine is assessed 10 times. And the top um, FML enforcement complaint is, of course, wrongful termination. That's usually what we see kind of head the list. That's what somebody sues for. And certainly um, that is where um, the FML comes underneath. And they say, you wrongly terminated me. And one of the reasons is because you mishandled my FML claim. Certainly, we can talk about the penalties and the fines, you know, the time that it all takes to defend a case. But one of the things that we're seeing more is both the negative impact on the work environment as well as the public perception of an employer. Um, we can't turn on our TV anymore without seeing something about, you know, who's violated an FML. I remember I was in Boston um, last year and it came across the wire that, there was a case in Wisconsin or Michigan, a convenience store. The woman was sitting with her son who was um, at one of the ch local children's hospital on life support, texted her employer and said, hey, I can't work my shift. It was like 48 hours ahead of time. I'm by my son who's on life support. He's in critical care. And they had an exchange over um, text message and the employer, the manager says, you know what, you're fired. 
I can't deal with the drama. I'm done. And, and this is, if you're not showing up, then I guess you're quitting. Needless to say, the employee grabs a screenshot of the interaction and it goes viral. So I was up in Boston and I was talking about this very incident and where it becomes a problem for employers because they're no longer just dealing with their employee, it's also their public relations. And um, they said, well, what was that case? And I said, well, wait a minute, let me, let me see if I can find it. And sure enough, I pulled it out on the Guardian from the UK. And that is who had the story of this employer interaction. And I will bet that about five phone calls happened right after that went viral for them. The first one was to the manager saying, you're fired and let's, you know, hope that we're not sued. And potentially as a manager, you're not sued directly. Um, two, let's call the employee and assure them that regardless of what's happening, she can take whatever time she needs to take care of her son. And then the next one's happened with in some type of order. They called their accountant to get the checkbook out because they were going to get sued and they know it. They called their attorney and they probably called the PR team. And one phone call probably came into their offices. And that was from the DOL saying, and we'll be at your office in five days. No longer are these type of mishandling of requests just between you and your employee. They go global and they go viral. Employees talk and they know, and it provides a negative um, perception, both on things like Glassdoor as well as in the news. And it really, for the HR teams, it's making sure that your managers understand the repercussions of how they handle FML requests and, re and requests for leaves. And here are just some of the court filing. So, you know, there's been a discrimination against um, GM. The U.S. Labor Mart um, fines the um, Electrolux to pay a former employee. But imagine this one. A fired employee goes ahead and they sue their employer. The suit set wins. The employee wins. And now this fired employee needs to be reinstated. You want to talk about an awkward first interaction? Here you are, and you're having to take that employee back into your work environment. And you know that there's got to be some hard feelings. There's going to be some negative repercussions to your work environment. I'm sure that that is not a, that was not a happy day. We're going to go ahead and send you um I believe the presentations get sent out and you can see where the hyperlinks are to read the actual articles. And this is all from, um, mostly from the last six months or so, from about September, I think is the oldest one, maybe August, all the way through. So it's not getting any easier for you. 470 plus leave laws in the United States alone. Um, these can cover a variety of issues, including the rise of the paid family leave. We'll talk a little bit more about that. It covers things such as domestic violence. So if a, an employee is part of a domestic violence situation, there's specific leave to school related and blood and organ donation. So certainly it's getting more and more complicated. And as you, we saw in that first slide, I think it's going to continue to proliferate. As we look at the prevalence of employee leave laws, um, your state of California is, is kind of leading the way with 35 different leave laws right now. But we can see that there's a significant amount that are in that moderate going into that high. And it really just gives us an understanding, especially for those that are in um, multiple states, of what exactly you're dealing with. Because not everything is just about the, the federal. And oftentimes, the um, rules and the governance around them is different. So like in New Jersey, it's only a thousand hours in order to qualify. So you're dealing with different, um, you're dealing with different requirements for each leave law. It also gets a little bit more complicated when you think about, um, if your workforce is remote. So I have a, um, an employee who works in 
you know, Georgia, but their bosses in Texas, what laws um, are applicable because they work from home. And the little bit of guidance around that is twofold. Where, what taxes do you take? What tax um, statement are they subject to is one way to look at it. And also where do they report? Um, when in doubt, we, we always suggest um, you may want to contact your attorney for some guidance, but those are the types of things that you want to think about before the situation happens or before you have a particular situation, what's your game plan? So state paid leave laws, and these are becoming more and more prevalent. Um, Massachusetts went into effect in 2019. Um, California has expanded in 2017 and they continue to expand in 2020. We have D.C. and then Washington State. Um, and what's coming soon? So you can see all of these purple states are where there is um, talk of creating a state paid family and medical leave. So there's kind of a blessing in disguise with being subject to more highly regulated states. So California is certainly one of them. There are states which have a mandatory disability plan or a large number of state leave laws. That's how we're defining highly regulated. But in fact, we actually um, see that you're more challenged, but you're a little bit more aware too. Um, so, you know, certainly if we're talking about coordinating absences, if you're in at least three different um, highly regulated states, so maybe you have employees in California, Washington, and New York or um, Minnesota, you're running at about 83%. It's 83% more difficult, 83, 81%, I apologize, of um, employers say that it's more of a challenge for them to coordinate absence for 66 in a non-regulated state. You know, just simply keeping up with the state laws and how they're changing and modifying. And then of course, making the decision is all key to that. Um, but one of the things that we did find is, is that um, you tend to be a little bit more advanced. You've thought through your policies. You've gone ahead and outlined them for what makes sense and how they're all going to work together. ADA, um, it was passed in 1990, expanded in 2008 with the AAA Act um, extension, and it's really about protecting the individual from work and making sure that um, you are complying with the reviews as well as the interactive process. I will tell you the piece that makes it the most complicated for most employers tends to be that additional, uh, granting additional leave um, as an accommodation. So an employee's exhausted all of their FML, maybe their state and their federal, um, maybe even your company policies, but they say, if at the end of the day, I could just have another two weeks, I can make it back to work. And that's something that employers are continuing to struggle with to understand and make that determination. And that's also seeing a cost where the Department of Labor handles um, FML, the EEOC handles ADA. And one of the interesting things about this is, is that once the DOL comes in or the ADA um, EEOC comes to investigate, everything under their jurisdiction is open to review. It doesn't just stop at the FML component, but in fact looks and says, um, anything that they would find. So if they found an OSHA violation, if they found a hiring practice or a pay scale, all of that can be opened and subject to review. And we're seeing the um, charges and the settlements go up. So $135 million worth of settlements, and that's up about 78% since 2010, and it continues to rise. So what are employers doing? Kind of what is the response that they're having and where are they focusing their efforts? So the largest one has been in that first component, documenting their return to work policies. How does this all work together? What are we going to require? Does the employee understand what's going to happen and be asked of them? And about 39% increase in employers saying, you wanna know what? We've taken some type of action to really sit down and think about how to make this all work 
from beginning to end and with all of the different company policies. Um, they're going ahead and they're matching durational guidelines based on diagnosis. So they're taking some look to say, you want to know what is what that employee is telling me is what that doctor saying um, really making sense against what something like the MD guidelines would say or durational guidelines. Do they really need to be out, you know, one day a week for, you know, the entire month, each, each week for a month to handle a migraine? Well, maybe that's not right. Or does that length of time make sense? And I think they're gaining some help through um, some of the outsourced solutions that they're looking at. The most common leaders that we're seeing are investing in accommodations. And what's interesting is where they're spending their time and their effort. Um, simple things like making the workplace accessible. Do you have grab bars? Are there, um, you know, electronic door openers for those really heavy doors? Um, are we engaging to make sure that there's ramps where it makes sense or elevators? And then certainly a qualify acquiring or modifying equipment, you know, sometimes we think of the big things, the sit sans desk. And I was talking with one of our voc rehabs and they said, what we found is we had somebody with a lower back pain issue and they could not, um, when they stood up, they had to pick up their phone and they had to bend over in order to take their phone call. So simply by offering them a wireless headset, we modified their equipment and it solved the problem that they had. So those types of acquisitions and modifications do not have to be big expenditures. So they're a great way to look at what's happening. And what we see is our industry leaders are really focusing their efforts on those two places. Um, it's a little less about restructuring your and modifying duties and adjusting work schedules. Certainly that comes into play. Um, but, but the biggest one is making sure that the environment makes sense for all employees and that they're making those small tweaks to locate to equipment. Um, the value of integration. And what's interesting here is, is that for the first time, we're really seeing that there is an emphasis on enhancing the employee experience. Um, as I've talked to employers who are evaluating options, one of the things that they'll ask us is, what does my employee experience? How does this affect them? Um, can I put all of these different types of leave together in one place so that they do not have to um, reach out to different places? Am I supporting them with things like disease management and my EAP program? And you can see kind of the increase of integration that we're seeing with STD and FML across these different perspectives. The more highly integrated that pro these programs are, the better the employee experience. And we know that as employers, as employees evaluate the job market, it, it's a tightening labor force. Um, employees are able to move around a little bit more. Certainly, we recognize that enhancing their experience and making them be, feel supported throughout the process is important. What's also interesting is the pop in the increase in productivity. At the end of the day, we need our employees to work and we need them to work productively. And we see that the more um, integrated we are, and we define that as 10 plus programs, so where we're integrating across these different dimensions, um, we're seeing a better increase in productivity. And that's important because it shows us that it's paying off. And this goes back to making the employee experience a priority. So it's very simple. It's really about your communication strategy. Are your policies clearly explained? What's covered? What isn't? Are they easy to understand? Does your managers on the line understand how to deal with that employee when that request comes in, even if it's simply to refer it to you as the HR manager? And do you explain the impact of leave on the employee's pay. Our industry leaders, those ones that have the higher index scores, are all really focused on making these types of adjustments to their policies. And they're communicating in ways that employees want to talk. Text messaging is probably the largest, um, being able to automatically dial, and then chat functionality. Um, we often call that the Amazon experience, right? I'm able to go in, click, they, they tell me what I need to know. They kind of know a little bit about me and I can 
function through the system quickly and easily with minimal um with minimal kind of disruption. Everything's right there for me. And more and more employees are looking at our policies and processes and our interactions and saying, is it as easy as, you know, that leading kind of buying experience? Those employers who are um, achieving positive outcomes, we can go ahead and see where the trends are. They're making the effort and they're seeing the most improvement in things like employee experience overall, the reduction of lost time, and the improved return to work. Certainly, we see that centralization leads the way. Um, being centralized with the vendor tends to be a little bit better result, but certainly in-house does well too. And then, of course, you can see um, index leaders, those with those higher scores, are going ahead and they're hitting and reporting better across these different dimensions. Um, some things to consider as you outsource, as you think about that and when you're evaluating, regardless of what your decision is or where you choose to land, it's about compliance resource. Are you going ahead and getting um, a consolidated compliance resource that's going to help you stay engaged and up to date on all of the different changes? Um, does that provide you with consistency? Does that vendor have a rule-based system that says, I'm going to apply your policies as well as the federal and the state and whatever else they're covering um, on the basis of rules that we program in and that's gonna drive my consistency. And then of course, I'm gonna give you reporting. I'm gonna let you know what is important, what you should have, um, to know, make sure that you're able to get that information where it's um, to your managers and then your employee customer experience, both you as the customer as well as your employer, employees. So um, Guardian has some offerings. I'm not gonna go through this in the interest of time, but certainly it's there. Um, we do have some additional resources that are on our general page. Again, the absence management scorecard, um, some quick checklists, uh, some information about the cost of mix management. All of this is generic to um, FML. It's not about our programs per se, um, but it's there to help you understand and um, kind of go through that experience and make sure that you're thinking about the right things. And then lastly, um, we'll take some questions. So um, I'm not seeing any. I don't know if there is any other questions. Um, but with that, I will go and say that um, we have your SHRM and HRCI credits available. Um, the SHRM activity is 20 SVKXC. And the HRC is 378064. I believe that this will be sent to you after um, the meeting as part of the follow-up. And um, I thank you for your time. Perfect. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for speaking to our group today. We hope you all found the webinar to be helpful and informative. Recertification credits will be emailed out shortly with the Membership Mixer promo code, so please keep an eye out. If you ever have questions, please reach out to us at San Diego SHRM. We're here as your resource, and thank you for being part of the San Diego SHRM community. We hope to see you next week, March 20th, at the Membership Mixer, and I hope you all have a great rest of your day.